Hello there, everyone. I'm joined by two very special guests. It's Daniel and Alistair from Space Dog. How are you doing, guys? I do. Hello. Well. How's it going? Doing quite well. Yeah. Thanks yeah, very us. good. So we're going to play some Star Trek Online. Do you guys know this game? Do you like this game? Uh, I've, I've played it uh, very briefly with a friend of mine. Uh, we got up to like level 30 or something just going through together. Uh, yeah. I know you've played <laughs> quite a lot <laughs> more I, I, of it than I, I, I have I've played done. a lot of this. This, uh, it stands alongside Elite Dangerous as games that I pumped thousands of hours into and then left forever. <laughs> I, I, I remember when I first met Dan, you, you, you said something about being the 11th... No, it was, well, we did a, uh, I used to have a guild that was like the 11th, 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 11th rated or 11th highest. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, I, I was pretty into this uh, a, a good while ago, but I, I haven't played it properly in a, in a long time. Oh, they've got yeah. the new uh, Discovery uniforms in there now. Yeah, I thought, I thought I'd is, build yeah. a new character. Right. So oh, this, okay. is this just the new expansion, right? It looks like it, yeah, Age of Discovery, yeah. Yeah, I've not Maybe seen any of this. I, I, I poked my head in, I think the last time I poked my head in was to try Agents of Yesterday, the TOS one. Oh, yeah. And uh, that was like it was like four four missions, and then it just drops, drops you back into the 24th century. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, it's a bit bizarre but, how the timeline works. It doesn't really make any sense. Because hmm. you can, it's like STO and Discovery are classed as like different factions within the game rather than time periods it's kind of bizarre wait what so there's a discovery faction in this yeah now. it it doesn't and it's such a good line is set after next generation yeah, yeah, right yeah. okay yeah it doesn't really make any sense so you can do like missions which are set in the 25th century as a dis start as a discovery starfleet era I I feel Character. like they wouldn't stand much of a chance. Although, having said that, they do start you in a Miranda class anyway, yeah. which is already, yeah. like, what, 170 years old at this point? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. <laughs> I That's see there's Dominion as well. I've missed a lot here. Yeah, there's, there's like, Dominion, there's, right? Dominion, there's Klingon, Romulan, loads of stuff. Nice. I have a I video, like... I'm working on a video about Star Trek Online. Uh, hopefully it'll be up next week. It's, like, 30 minutes long. Wow. <laughs> I've been editing, like, like a madman. But hopefully it'll be good. Right. Oh, looking forward to it. Yeah. So what are we thinking? Are we thinking beard for this guy? Oh, absolutely. Go ridiculous giant handlebar mustache. <laughs> the classic <laughs> Star Trek look. <laughs> Captain Price type stuff, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Beard and bald head or beard and... Ooh, what have we got there? Hmm. Oh, so you got to get the Elrond uh, hair, hairdo on the go. Where I quite that? like the Discovery uniforms. I, I quite really, like them. I really like them. Yeah. Do you know what? I just, I just after seeing the uh, the trailers for the new uh, season, what I realized what I like more about them is, I guess, the cut because Pike's uniform looks great. It's, mm. it's in gold. Yeah. 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 And they still have that kind of like neckerchief. Yeah. Thing going the, on. the little uh, asymmetrical collar. Yeah. yeah. I like that a lot. Oh, Love that's, it. That's, that's it. Dear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very good. I don't have the greatest tech on this computer, so it kind of streams like shit. Okay, so what what shall our captain name be? Uh, uh, oh, no, you can't call him Captain something, can you? No. <laughs> captain, <laughs> captain, Captain, Captain. <laughs> Admiral Captain would be quite an unfortunate name. <laughs> <laughs> then Ensign Captain's a bit presumptuous. Yeah. So you end up with... In the wrong oh, camp. In the, <laughs> in the wrong the camp slot as well. <laughs> what was the name we ended up settling on for our pilot in a uh, uh, Star Wars Isn't it like X-Wing Alliance? Panbolo oh, or something. Panbolo. Pan <laughs> <laughs> With like a capital A after P and then a capital O at the end. <laughs> uh, this is the kind of thing that drives me mad. Like I, I know, I, I know like I, I, ju I judge other people for because we'll start this now right. and you'll hang around Earth Space Dock or whatever and there'll be loads of people. Hello, Pan! Like, yeah, oh, <laughs> <laughs> Loads of people called like C Captain Snipe You Dead four four six of the of the of the USS like Enterprise with a Z or whatever. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's tons of people that have named their ships Enterprise with a Z. Yeah, yeah I do. There we go, Captain Proton. Because I know you're such a huge <laughs> Voyager fan. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind those Captain Proton episodes actually. I have a song oh, for right. some reason. Oh, I mean like. I think uh, they might have been more endearing were they not buried in a million other holodeck episodes. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, uh, like a, a full third of Voyager is holodeck episodes. <laughs> yeah. There's uh, the spirit folk stuff that they did later on with the Irish town. Oh, yeah. Is... The, um, 
god awful. That's, that, it's, it's unbearable. There, there are there are parts of Voyager that it, it's it's like being interrogated or something. You just, <laughs> want, you just want it to end. <laughs> Once them get so to the utterly boring. The briefing yeah. room, uh, it's quite insufferable, and it's just. Uh, the captain and uh, what's the name? What's the clear one called? I don't. I, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there is no problem that it, that can't be solved by techno battle in, in Star Trek Voyager. It's, it's, it's pretty unforgettable. Uh, B- Belana Torres is probably my least favorite character on that thing. Mm. Fields must be at least three characters. We'll give it a dot then. There we go. So we have. So what are they kicking us off with here in terms of uh, Discovery era ships? Like, are we getting there? I don't know. Actually, I haven't played it as Discovery yet. That looks well, like, uh, I think the one that was behind the screen was the Malakowski class. Could have been. I wasn't paying attention. I was more focused on the hairdos. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, I think Discovery has generally done a great job with Federation ship designs. I think they, uh, they Oh, they yeah, yeah. Great. The Klingon Less designs, so the Klingon yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Klingon, I think, I don't mind changes to visual things and all that, but I think the Klingon mm. designs are a bit much. Especially because they've yeah. got like four nostrils now, and and like heads that are twice as big they, as they should be, and they're kind of reverting back to older Klingon styles, right? In the new series, they've got the, they've got the hair back in hair. And yeah, and there's like given, a D seven looking thing. Yeah, and they're given Laurel like a sort of undiscovered country style outfit and things. Yeah, yeah. I'm very, I'm I'm really looking forward to season two of Discovery. I think it looks yeah looks good. Show some cool promise. Time. Oh, press any key. There we go. Do we know anything more about the new uh, Patrick Stewart show that's supposed to be coming out? Not too much, no. No? I mean, I have a theory that it's a Star Trek Destiny adaptation, but that's just... Oh, like, that would be incredible. So like, if, good. If, 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 <laughs> yeah. And they... Because I, I thought when it came out, I sort of like half-jokingly <laughs> suggested, I was like, wouldn't it be great if it was Destiny? Mm. And then uh, they did the uh, the read-through and Nicole Dubois tweeted out a picture of herself with Patrick Stewart. I was like, oh, oh my God, what's going on? What? what? <laughs> it's like, surely they're not doing that. It would be very exciting if it was Destiny. Uh, yeah, I'd be just... I don't know how hyped I'd be. I'd just be through the roof with about that. I mean, it, like Star Trek Destiny is like completely reliant on people having seen loads of Star Trek, though. So, I mean, yeah. I'm not, it's not very, like, entry-level, which seems is to contradict. I guess you could... You can yeah. tweak. I think it was supposed to be till yeah. I guess you could tweak it, tweak an adaptation of Destiny a wee bit mm. to make it a bit more accessible. I don't know. But enough about established fra- sci-fi franchise. Let's talk about the next best thing. Let's talk about the Sojourn, shall we? Okay. okay. <laughs> best segue. Yeah. yeah, that's definitely not taking up enough of my attention on a day-to-day basis. What we need is more of it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's chugging along, and I think there's going to be uh, an update pretty soon. By by the end of the month, I plan to 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 like clarify the exact where we're up to and when when mm. when you can be expecting things, uh, mm. because. You know, it's 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 been we've been going through the the art process, which uh, is just like a lot of trial and error. And we, we're obviously we're all um, we're all employed or students or whatever in our own things. So um, there's there's a lot of just trying to work around everyone's schedules, and we're all in different time zones. So it can be a bit of a slog, but it's 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 coming together now. And uh, it's a pretty international team. Yeah, we, which ended up with. sounds impressive at first, but then you realise how often it requires me to get up really early and stay up really late let's, to, to do anything. Let, let's, let's, let's be honest, Dan. Sleeping outside of normal time scales is not really a problem for you. No. So you do, you yeah. do a lot of the storyboarding with, uh, with, with Gabriel, right? Yeah. And he's in Brazil. He's in Brazil. And then when that's done, we have to send it to Leon, our artist, who is in Malaysia. <laughs> so we have to, like, every day it's how much can we get done before two in the morning BST or now GMT, yeah. because that's when the, you know, he wakes up. <laughs> and if we if we haven't if we haven't got him the reference material, and then we go to sleep, then we've skipped his whole day <laughs> where he can't do anything because he hasn't got the reference material, and everyone's asleep. So yeah, <laughs> uh, I knew there were some it's people all... across the pond, but I didn't know there were people in Brazil and all that as well. Yeah, our science advisor and storyboard artist is in Brazil. Um, oh, you got a science advisor as well. Very swanky. Yeah, yeah, he's. Um, uh, astronomy student. Uh, I, I, I think he's in. He's, he's pretty, he knows his stuff. Does Gabriel? Yeah. He's a. Uh, is he astronomy? Is it like rocketry? Uh, I, I think. I think. It, I don't know. I, I don't want to like <laughs> mess this up. You've been thrown under the bus here, Dan. <laughs> Ast- astro something. Astro space. <laughs> but yeah, he definitely knows his stuff. 
and he's been he was like uh, he's like super involved now so we can um we we've like he he wrote all the uh all the technology and and sort of background for how drift works and all the various um, yeah which we uh, kind of went into with the uh the drift and drift gates video yeah we sort of ran that mm. on archive series for a while which yeah. is quite fun. one of our one of our low level kickstarter rewards is going to be uh, a downloadable copy of his dissertation on drift oh wrote. yeah like <laughs> oh, wow. we made that we made that video but prior to that he'd written like a how long was it it was like it's like three pages long it's, it's like, pretty <laughs> serious it's a like it's full dissertation yeah. all about drift and how it works and yeah and he's theoretical like theoretical <laughs> physics yeah i mean it's, there's, there's like an entire school School of uh, <laughs> of like experimental rev- relativity that he's come up with to make it work. Oh, <laughs> yes, as we cotton socks. Yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> pretty yeah. nice. So, how did the sojourn come about? What's the the Batman Begins style origin story of, oh. of how you started that uh, you, thing? The, the the more and more I find out about this, the more and more I realize how far back it's actually gone. Oh, as yeah. an idea in your head. There's um like this this uh, general concept for a story has existed under like five different names with like 10 different casts of characters mm. for like a decade like uh, I've just been sort of bouncing it around and having like in- increasingly I- I've got a-, a writing folder on my computer of like all the current writing projects I've got and like a full third of them are defunct different alternate names. names for what is now the sojourn <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, 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 you went with one uh, pretty shortly before settling on the current version of it um, what was what was it called? Was it the Sojourn with a subheading? Or was it oh, it was origi- it, there was a, p- a time when it was called Avalon: The Sojourn War, which uh, oh, when yeah. it was part of a subtitle, and then uh, I, I streamlined that a bit. But like, I'm I'm very happy with the title now because it, it's like it's got like multiple layers of relevance to both the world and the and the short term story, and like it doesn't it doesn't necessarily lose its um its like application if we tell other stories in the same location. Like it's, yeah. it it still works. Um, like like the, like you got like Battlestar Galactica. If if we if you wanted to write something in that world that isn't about the Battlestar Galactica, you're in trouble because yeah. it's like yeah, you've yeah. got to put it in the title. But yeah, uh, otherwise you end up with names like Blood and Chrome. Yeah, but well, at least Blood and Chrome actually had the Galactica in it. Like uh, uh, yeah. uh, like this, and and they've they've managed to like because if you, if you wanted to tell a story that did not feature that ship in any way. You'd have, like, well, I mean, Caprica was that. And yeah, it, and Caprica, it, and it was, that was ju- it. it was just called Caprica. So, uh, yeah. People uh, keep telling me to watch that. On my Battlestar Galactica videos, I was like, I'm not interested in Cap- in Caprica, I'm not going to watch it. And then a bunch of people in the comments were like, no, you got to watch it. You can't no, skip you Caprica. You don't need to watch it. watch it. It's no I know, good. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> it I mean, it, it's fine, but it, it's like, it's a bizarre choice to make as a spin-off series. Like, um... Because I feel like it, it kind of killed Blood and Chrome's chances. Like they, like they did Battlestar Galactica, and then if you want to do a spin-off, the logical decision is to do the yeah, first Siren War. Like that's war, what yeah. anyone would think. But instead, they decided to do this like soap opera about Adama's yeah. dad, and uh, and that nobody cared. And then it was after like how they was, first I, created the Cylons or something, isn't it? Yeah, I mean that the, that's sort of interesting, but the whole like. Uh, plot of the main show kind of makes that less and less important like the, the way it sort of fits into the cobol and old earth and everything like when when the 12 colonies made centurions is less and less important as you uh, as you see the bigger picture in the main show yeah, yeah. so it, se- it seems weird to devote a series to exploring that yeah it seems bizarre i always think like there's a good pat oswalt quote where he's like stop telling me how the shit i love got created just show me the shit i love yeah and i think <laughs> that's a perfect and you know encapsulation of why most prequels are not mm. very good but like so in the writing of the sojourn have you do you guys like have much experience writing anything or is this like completely uncharted territory uh it's, it's largely uncharted territory um for me uh i've 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 never written anything that's been used or released in any until, until this uh but also uh i i'm trying to be sort of constantly aware of my own limitations in that regard the uh i fully intend to assemble a writing team if we get funded like the uh the, the pilot is written in such a way as to not take too many chances and just set everything up so that if we get funded we can build a team of writers and, and have more versatility uh i mean i've i, I think it's I, i've definitely improved doing it and i've done uh, a lot of courses and stuff where I, ever since i got into this and uh, but but still, um, in order to avoid sort of George Lucas syndrome of, uh, of, every, of everything being sort of dominated yeah. by by one uh, not very experienced viewpoint, uh, I definitely want to assemble a writing staff uh, if we get funded. Yeah, smart. Yeah. So when 
in the creation of the Sojourn, did you ever was it? Did you ever have like kind of gripes that you had with other sci-fi shows where you thought I'm gonna fix this in in the Sojourn and I'm gonna correct this? Oh well, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we've kind of done the opposite in a lot of ways. <laughs> Just done it all again. <laughs> there's um, there's a lot of like uh, I, I I think with almost, with almost everything I've ever written, the um, the immediate. Th- uh, sort of tenants I lay out is uh, like for God's sake no time travel alternate oh. universes body swapping uh, <laughs> like uh, shape shifting any- anything that exists as an excuse to make everything different for a bit and then not matter yeah. but there's so yeah. much of that and St- Star Trek is so Star guilty of that oh, <laughs> it's yeah, so yeah. guilty of it like um, I, I, I mean transporters and stuff yeah yeah, yeah. I mean I, I kind of appreciate the mirror universe but I only really appreciate it because they the went mir- back to it a few times. The, yeah, the, it, the, the, the mirror universe is like a fun break from from Star Trek. Yeah, but, like it, but and also stuff that happens in a mirror universe episode might be relevant in a future mirror universe episode. Yeah. Where, whereas like all the holodeck ones and the body swapping ones and somebody's mental faculties are. I mean, I'm not watching Star Trek to watch everything not be like Star Trek. You, you know, it's, it's also yeah. big enough for the uh, Star Trek Attack Wing miniatures game to get its entire own faction of mirror universe mm. stuff. Yeah, mm. which is, uh, I I always feel like the mirror universe stuff in Star Trek is basically the excuse for the actors to have a bit of fun and play like yeah. a yeah. really cheesy yeah. bad guy and all that. The ones I feel that like the best example of that was probably the one from Star Trek Enterprise, right? Oh, but that's yeah, great. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. They, they look like yeah, they're yeah. having a blast. Uh, yeah. Oh, there's a crossfield class. Oh yeah, very nice. That's the Glenn, isn't it? Yeah. Ah. And Archer's yeah. constantly being mocked by his mirror universe self. That's a. <laughs> Yeah, the what the worst thing about single episode, like stuff that doesn't matter in Star Trek, is the single episode romance stuff. Oh no, that that they, has never worked in anything they ever. Never like, get it right. Well, it's impossible. I, I'm not, I'm convinced that it's just a uh, it's just an, an unworkable idea for an, an episode formula. Like mm. uh, even even Deep Space Nine did it with uh, Meridian, where Jadzia Dax oh, goes to that planet that's phasing in and out. And if Deep one. Space Nine can't do it, nobody can do it. That's that's yeah. that's the rule. And, the only uh, one that yeah. the only one that kind of works is, I guess, the Captain's Holiday, but that's not really like it. Never works because they always fall like, you know, completely in love, and they're like, yeah. "I'm gonna, you know, dedicate the rest, abandon well, my they, Starfleet career for you." And it's like, no, you can't do that. And like, they go back to the same character with that, don't yeah, they? Yeah, at the very least, Vash does get revisited a bit. Yeah. Also, it, I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure Patrick Stewart was actually having an affair with the actress that played. Vash, yeah, I heard about that. Which is totally... <laughs> really? I did not know. <laughs> yeah, that. yeah. Um, We've if, got to get this guest star back a few more times. If, 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 if it seemed like they had chemistry, there was probably a reason for that. But also, um, that episode didn't try to be like a full romantic tragedy. Like, like it. It was. Yeah. It could, it's just like the start of a relationship. Yeah. Whereas, it was like a fun uh, little like, fling. Yeah. So it yeah, like like uh, Meridian from Deep Space Nine. It needs to be like these people meet oh. and they have their entire emotional arc, and then she wants to leave Starfleet, and then she wants to sacrifice herself to save him. And it's like it's like what should be months upon months of, mm, of yeah, development yeah. just crammed into no it, time like, at all. Yeah, it never works. And like the worst, I mean, the worst one in, in well, Meridian's really bad, but the, also the worst one in my opinion is um, bloody what's it called, Sub Rosa, which is the the candle ghost bastard thing oh no no <laughs> forgot about that oh yeah and, uh, oh dear. I can't no. forget about that <laughs> it's ingrained on my memory for all time Which is, it always I makes remember. me laugh especially when you sit through episodes like Spock's Brain and Sub Rosa and Meridian and things <laughs> like that and then there's fans that go and watch Discovery and they're like oh now Star Trek's ruined yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, oh, really? don't get me started <laughs> yeah, and we're going to open up that can of worms. It's, it's, yeah. yeah. I saw a lot of articles around the time when, when Discovery was airing that really pretty highly praised the episode with the mud. The time I didn't get one. that. I, that was, I wasn't a huge fan of that one. No, but, I, 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 I mean, I liked the idea of, uh, like, I mean, within the boundaries of Star. I mean, not obviously. I would, I would never write a time loop episode myself, mm. but uh, it's, it's, it's established within Star Trek, and it's kind of handy as a sort of fun character development tool but they did it way too early in discovery yeah yeah, yeah. like uh like when stargate sg1 did it with window of opportunity which is like a, a beloved episode it was like season four like uh you, mm. you don't do that when you don't know who these people are yet you, you, you need to have the status quo before you can mess with it for laughs 
And you know, I guess that episode was there to just kind of accelerate the relationship between Ash. Oh, and... it certainly accelerated it. It <laughs> accelerated it from non-existent to to full fledged <laughs> in two scenes. <laughs> uh, oh, massive, yeah. Tell us about uh, Force Recon. How did that come about? Because that's with the Expanse team itself, isn't it? Yeah, that came about by me pestering the Expanse team for two and a half years. <laughs> oh, apologies. oh dear! Apologies. Oh, we're gonna have to Fungal. cut this out. Oh dear! Oh, the, oh, the shame. Angus. Unprofessional. <laughs> Most of the time, people just yeah. space doc unprofessional. Surely we can't be serious. <laughs> uh, yeah. Missing all this apologies. important dialogue. That's what are we talking about? about Force Recon. Force Recon. Force Recon. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So uh, the exp- the expanse got started, and um, they did their first season. Uh, I, at that point, I relentlessly tried to get in contact with them to uh, to try and help them establish like their ship law and stuff because it hadn't been touched on at all. And I was co- I was convinced that if the show got picked up, then there would be like reference books everywhere, and they'd just do it themselves, and that there'd be no chance of me getting involved. So I, I like relentlessly went after them for it, and I got uh, lots of like automated responses and uh and like delays and things and and it didn't really go anywhere and then uh i i I wrote this huge pitch i actually it was the morrigan class what became the morrigan i I wrote this huge like uh in universe mcrn fleet document on how i would flesh it out and how i would give it more info and i I sent that to them and i didn't get anything back and then they did they got picked up and they did all of season two and i was i was amazed that, that it still hadn't got any like uh reference material or like uh, any kind of spin-off books or anything like that and it's largely I think down to how sci-fi handled the show there was there was mm. a lot of uh, that, they, that they didn't potentially have as much faith in it as I think they should have um, uh, but then later on I was I, I was in contact with uh, Bob Monroe the former VFX head for uh, for the expanse and he, he eventually put me in contact with Ty Frank and uh, and some others from the team mm. And uh, I actually, I when I, when I pitched it, I, I I had all the stuff that I'd used for the previous pitch. Uh, this time to give them in person because I I got through, and I I had a Skype call with Ty Frank, Bob Monroe, and Naren Shankar, who wrote oh, wow. a lot of Deep Space Nine. Oh wow! He, uh, he wrote he wrote the episode. Um, what's the the quickening, which is a classic episode of Deep Space oh, Nine, yeah. the, uh, the, the the disease one with Bashir. Mm. So uh, we we ended up chatting about that a bit, and uh, and I, I was I'm not gonna lie, I was I was pretty panicky in that call. <laughs> like uh, Ty, Ty, Ty Frank is a is a an icon as far as I'm concerned. He's a, he's yeah, a huge yeah. inspiration to me, and yeah. uh, to be in the same chat with all those people was pretty nuts. Yeah, because my next but question we, was was about to be, got, have you ever fanboyed about it and things oh like God, that? Oh God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but basically we we um we ended up in a flow that we're still doing now where um. We'll pick out a ship and they'll send us all of the um, all of the concept art and the three D turntables and oh, stuff like that. Getting to see the, the assets ship. they send wow. over to us for those it, things. Yeah. It's, great. it's like Christmas whenever one of those yeah. packages gets sent. So we see all the stuff and then we write a script and uh, annotate it with with all of our various um, group uh, like logic and and why we why we made certain decisions and then we send it in and Ty Frank vets it and approves everything and checks whether anything's law breaking etc. Oh, it's about the do PDCs. It. That's a fun story. Oh, yeah. right. yeah. <laughs> that was weird. That was uh, there was a time when uh, I w- I was trying to figure out the the, the caliber of the PDCs for uh, oh, yeah. the Morrigan class, and I, I think I because because sometimes we get sent to different we get like forwarded to people from different parts of the team because people are busy and stuff, and a lot of the time there's a lot of like here's who we are and here's what's going on because not everybody knows so uh, we have to re-explain ourselves quite a lot, but. Um, <laughs> We did the forty millimeter, and I'd written that it was forty millimeter, and somebody had said, uh, "Can we check that? Are we sure that's the size?" And then somebody else who I didn't know entered into the email thread with like, uh, "I've got the I've got the model from when we do the um, the like exterior so- shots on the surface of the Rossi. So I'll oh, go yeah. and like lit- I'll go and literally measure it." And I was like, "What?" <laughs> and, I just, and then I, I sent them in I sent them in a screenshot of the. Uh, of the the consoles on the Rossi, which say forty millimeter PDCs, I was like, I found this. It's forty millimeter, and they were like, Oh yeah, <laughs> okay then. Don't don't worry about that. It's like the only <laughs> correction they've ever made. Well, it was one, it was one of a few. Yeah, they, they, yeah we we don't get many corrections, but that one was bizarre because because I think um, like sometimes people, we we get uh, diff- different people who uh, and, and and there's been a lot of like staff shift arounds because of um, Amazon taking over. 
Oh, yeah. So we, 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 we get put into different people, and uh, there was a big regime change with the VFX department, so we mm. had to explain who we were to the new guys and all that. <laughs> and I'm amazed we're still on, to be honest. There are people, there are people who aren't, and, and we're still around, which is, which is very weird. There's a huge shift over from Netflix to... Uh... Uh, there's yeah. rather sci-fi to Amazon and half the team's gone but they kept spaced off yeah they kept spaced off that's uh, that was interesting yeah. It's, yeah I really hope Amazon promotes that show like to high heavens because they certainly seem to intend yeah. to which is nice yeah which is really nice because a lot more people should be watching that show it's like such yeah. high quality and just not that many people know about it which is a shame I mean it's the best sci-fi show we've had since uh, Battlestar Galactica I think the uh, it's, 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 it's pretty fantastic mm. yeah yeah. And uh, it's the only thing that survived. We were like, like a couple of years ago, we had like this TV sci-fi renaissance where the Sci-Fi Channel was supposed to be like returning to the glory days of like Farscape and all that. And oh, yeah. We got we got Dark Matter, Killjoys, and The Expanse, and within a year, like it was just The Expanse <laughs> left, and even even that barely made it out. Like uh, it's, just, like, it's just it's just that's that's how that renaissance know, was handled. Short-lived renaissance. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember I I made a video called uh, the Golden Age of Sci-Fi TV. <laughs> Oh, uh, like yeah. in the 90s, you had like three different Star Trek shows, and you had Battlestar Galactica come back in the 2000s, and you had Farscape, and you had Stargate, and all these shows running at the same time that were all about yeah. space and spaceships and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're absolutely and, uh, right. Yeah, and then it shifted to kind of X Files stuff, which I just got really quite sick of. Yeah. And then the end of that video ends with me going like, oh, but I remain optimistic because Sci Fi Channel has, has this bunch of stuff, and then, <laughs> and then, there's, and then half of it's cancelled. Yeah, yeah, but that really was like, uh, like from from TNG to like the end of Stargate Universe, it was just like nonstop great sci-fi. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. for that entire period, I wasn't watching it either. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, like, I, I was, I was, uh, I was in living with my family in England, watching BBC or whatever. So I had no idea that any of this was happening. <laughs> so I, I missed that entire thing. I think I must have I must yeah. have got into sci-fi in a big way almost the moment that it ended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Similar yeah. thing for me because I'm showing my my youth here, but I was only born I was born in '95, so I wasn't. That's same same here actually. Same oh here. really? Oh yeah. my god, am I the oldest but, uh, one here? That's sad. <laughs> but I was yes, like, Alistair's our resident old man, the old <laughs> man of the dock. That's what we call him. Shut up, kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but. Uh, I remember growing up, my dad would always like tape episodes of TNG and Battlestar Galactica off TV and things like that. But I didn't really get what was going on. And I remember seeing vague clips of like Deep Space Nine and Voyager and things like that. But it was only much later that I went back and rewatched Babylon Five all the way through and rewatched Farscape properly and all that kind of stuff and really got mm. into it. And I was like, man, these were such good shows. Like, where yeah. are they now? Kind of thing. Yeah, it's. Yeah. Uh, I, th- I think like there's a few really unfortunate fall throughs. Like like Stargate tried to put all of its eggs into the TV movie basket, and then Netflix happened. So it was mm-hmm. like complete. Just basically, it went from like a like a, a strong popular franchise that was really well resourced and and like completely uh, safe from cancellation, and then just completely destroyed itself because they uh, they tried to they tried to lean in- entirely on TV movies, and that's just not a thing anymore because mm-hmm. of streaming, yeah. which is a shame. <laughs> So let's go way back. What is the Batman Begins style origin of Space Dock itself? Like, how did you actually get around to starting your channel? Well, ah. we this is probably around the time that we knew each other when we both went to university. Uh, was it like three years ago now? It would have been late twenty fifteen, mid mid to late twenty fifteen. Yeah, yeah. And uh, we, we were we were both studying first year at the university here, and um, we you, you, did you start it before or after you started the Sci Fi Society? Did I start Space Dock? Yeah. I started Space Dock after the Sci-Fi Society. Okay. And I don't think I would have done if I hadn't done the Sci-Fi Society first. Yeah, I, I, I went to uh, Glindo University in Wrexham. Uh, I was, I was mm-hmm. doing um, creative computing, which is a course that they made up to, uh, to, to like... like uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's Glindo is a bit famous for... Um, making up courses and roping people in. Yeah, yeah like, like all, like, <laughs> they have loads of courses that are just... Um, they're made up of the same classes. So I, I actually switched courses and I was still going to the same classes with the same people, just in a different order. <laughs> Like, uh, <laughs> and I was like, "Hang on a minute." Okay, so, so there's um, there's loads of people that I I know 
who were obviously there because they wanted to do something very specialized and they fell into this con. Mm. Like you were doing environmental yeah. engineering. Ah, uh, renewable energy engineering. Yeah. yeah. And we know Charlotte who did uh, astronautics yeah. and stuff. And like people end up doing these because because it seems like they have these specialized courses, but they were just engineering courses. Like yeah. it was just the same. Uh, yeah. Like uh, like everything I did was programming. It wasn't that there wasn't any creative computing happening. But um, wow. even still, I, I was only doing IT because it was like the least objectionable thing. I had absolutely no idea what the hell I wanted to do with myself at all. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 so I was there and I started a Science Fiction Society at the uni, which uh, was when I met Alistair mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, some other people. I was through Star Trek Attack Wing because yeah. I got like a box for Christmas and I needed someone to play with. <laughs> yeah, so that's how Star Trek Attack Wing brought us together. And then uh, I started Space Dock. Um, and it was terrible at first. My early videos are a, a tragedy. <laughs> the first one is in 480p. It was made on, it was made on MS Paint and Movie Maker, and, uh, <laughs> and it, it's truly awful. I need to refit the uh, T sixty five X wing at some point because it doesn't deserve to be commemorated in that video. We should do that. We should do that soon, actually. Yeah, we should. Yeah, but yeah, I started it out, and you know, like the. The, the first year it was doing okay and it made a bit of money well actually I was, I was I was very lucky on my first video even though it's terrible my first video got uh, upvoted a lot on the Star Wars subreddit and oh, nice. and Star Wars Explained commented on it and I was a huge Star Wars Explained fan I am a huge Star Wars Explained fan and he commented on it and I was like oh my god this is crazy and it kind of died down for a bit and I was plodding along and eventually uh, Star, uh, Alex from Star Wars Explained offered to do a collaboration um, which was when I, I did an, a video on the TIE Interceptor on his channel. And uh, that really kicked everything off for Space Dog. Yeah. I mean, like uh, a second a second collaboration I did with him later was uh, Thrawn Week, where we did, oh, yeah. we did like five videos on Thrawn across both channels. And that is still the most subscribers we've ever got in a, a short time. Like, it, that, that was huge. Like, there was no stopping it after that. Stalls explained it really was the pariah that lifted up. I mean, it, and it's the, the same. He did the same thing for the Templar Institute and everything. Like, yeah. he, he's, he's a, a total legend, Alex. He, uh, there's, uh, he he's really helps out these small channels and gives them, like, loads of... Uh, he's a really great publicity. guy. He is a great guy. Yeah. yeah. But, yeah. I should uh, make Star Wars videos. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't made them in a long time. So that's pretty cool that you had like uh, an actual concept of the channel in general going into it. Because my early videos, God, if you can find them, my early videos were me ripping off the Nostalgia Critic. Oh, right. <laughs> which <laughs> has aged possibly the worst way ever. And uh, it was about like Starship Troopers or something like that. Oh, right. I was reviewing Starship Troopers, which is still like a movie I'm really fond of and then yeah. mine just sort of died down for ages and I just kept trying different things and I tried podcasts and all kinds of things and eventually it was only when I started making like Star Trek retrospective videos that mm. the channel kind of took off for me in that way and then because for a while I, try, I did like a Star Trek marathon reviews and then I was like oh people must be coming to my channel for marathons of reviews and things. So then I tried yeah. doing Marvel movies and nobody turned up to watch any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and I realized I don't actually care that much about Marvel movies, which is probably why the videos aren't very good. So then mm. I switched over to uh, Why Babylon 5 is Awesome and all that kind of stuff. And Why Babylon 5 is Awesome, I think, is still one of my highest viewed videos. It's like Yeah, I mean, th- there, there are things, there are IPs like Babylon 5 and The Expanse now mm. where their fan bases are just the right size that they will get really really excited about a video and it and you won't get like lost in the mess like uh like babylon 5 even though it's like not been on screens for years uh it it has like a a dedicated fan base who will definitely watch your video and you're pretty much guaranteed to get on the top of the reddit and stuff like that if you do it so uh you you, it's it's similar for a lot of old like 90s ips like that because we discovered the uh the wing commander cic recently yeah and um scrolling through it literally just a couple weeks ago we found out that they i mean you you discovered wing commander CIC. i've been looking at it for years but (laughs) we found out that they were reposting like all of these space dog videos that we've been uploading yeah. over the course of like the last several months yeah and like we only just found out about this but if you get uh if you make videos on a franchise that is really excited to have any coverage then uh you'll get more views than you expect like um the expanse in the early because one of our highest videos ever is uh the donager class back when i made it before it was official the unofficial donager mm. class video and that oh. was like that was like early season two expanse and it was on the top of the expanse subreddit for like a week like you uh 
because the fan base is just the right size to be really excited about something like that. Mm. And it's good. Yeah, because uh, Babylon Five, especially, it's it's one of those things where it's like not a whole lot of people know about it. I guess mainstream is the word. It's not really mainstream, but mm. the people that do know it know how good it is, so they'll they'll jump yeah. at a chance to. <laughs> Sorry, I was laughing at. I, mean, I named the ship Soul Patch. I, I just noticed that, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like the reverse capitalization as well, so it's like a lowercase s and p, and then the rest of it is caps. <laughs> also, what, what, what just happened there? Did the Klingons capture the captain, and then he told everyone to fire on their position, and then the Klingons decided that the only leverage that they have was the captain to, to stop these guys from shooting at them, and then they stabbed him? Was, was that what just happened? I mean, that yeah, sounds like the Klingons. I think so. Okay. Okay, cool. Just making sure I'm up to speed. <laughs> so is this like a... This This seems like a sort of discovery conversion of the existing tutorial. Like, doesn't a similar thing happen yeah. in the st- normal it tutorial looks, where your captain gets captured? Yeah, it pretty much looks almost identical. Same freighter mm. as well. Or the last... Uh, in the other one, it's Quark that's commanding the freighter. Oh, right. Which is funny. <laughs> I do love that they just find any excuse to slap in yeah. all these existing characters into Stowe. <laughs> I really like the ship combat. It's just solid. It is great ship combat yeah. in Stowe. Uh, I have mixed feelings about the ship combat. Uh, I, I I think the ship combat is better early in the game, like uh, when mm. when you still turn slowly and everything. Like later on, you start turning really fast, and you have way too, way too many powers and buttons to press, mm. and it just becomes very MMO ish. But I, I quite like the early game ship combat. I hate the ground combat, and I, I hate the writing in Stow. <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the whole the Iconians are behind it all thing is so tiresome. It's like it, it just it keep, keep and, it, and it keeps going forever and and it, it's the, a million missions, very repetitive. Yeah, but yeah. I, Vic- I, Victory's I, life was pretty good actually. The, uh, life. The, the DS9 thing they did a mission where DS9 got captured again and you uh, did a oh, mission that... where you did, you did like a space walk outside the. Station, oh yeah, that was, was really great. Cool. That was great. Yeah. All all the best stuff came after launch with uh, Stowe, like because um, yeah. like there are still. There are still Romulan front missions that are from launch and things, and they're just like, it's like uh, interminable. Go, mm. um, but yeah, the uh, the and the Davidian ones were okay, but they were pretty packed with like irritating puzzle bits and stuff. Like, um, oh, yeah, you have to go and make make somebody a drink or whatever. <laughs> you have to go and oh, yeah. find the exact sequence of gin that somebody wants in their drink. Oh yeah, I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> There's also real like, Star um, Trek experience. The, the scanning, all the mini games are not very good. Like it's like the scanning radiation thing where you have to match a thing with another thing and it makes some bleeps oh, and bleeps yeah. and does a thing. Yeah. It's not, not very good. Start of interest is this is this ship that we're flying? Does it have impulse engines on the end of its nacelles? Like the, there's no color it difference like between it, yeah. them. Yeah, yeah, look. That's very interesting. Because so. usually that's blue, though. Yeah. Like, unless that's like the warp bit underneath it, I'm not sure. I mean, they do look like impulse. Like they have their vents and stuff. Yeah, so. that's Maybe the thing it... which which sent my brother nuts in uh, the 2009, the first Kelvin timeline Star Trek movie when uh, the USS Kelvin rams the Narada, and in order to like power up its thrusters to go ram it, it the warp nacelle lights up. Oh. Oh, my brother, my brother was in the cinema and he lost his shit. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, he was like "That's the wa- wrong engine." I hope he didn't watch Into Darkness because that's got far more uh, like egregious <laughs> stuff. Like, like when they they beamed from San Francisco to Kronos using something that fits in the back of Khan's car. Oh, yeah, he's <laughs> like, "It's a portable trans warp beaming device," and I'm like, "It's a what and a what and a what now?" <laughs> oh dear. So what's next? I really enjoyed. Have... Uh, go, sorry, go ahead. No, you go, sir. I was going to say I really enjoyed uh, Star Trek Beyond. That was. Uh, oh yeah, I really like that one. Yeah. yeah, that's that's probably my favorite of the uh, Kelvin timeline movies. Yeah, I definitely I, agree. I prefer 2009. It's, it's just more fun. 2009 is it's know, a pretty the, solid movie. What's the general consensus with that? I, I think most Star Trek fans generally like Beyond the best. Oh well, okay. Which, uh, it's kind of. I, I do really like the 2009 one though. By the time of Beyond, uh, it's when Kirk is acting most like Kirk and stuff. Like they're, mm. they're all, everything's kind of underway, and the yeah. dynamic is in place. That's true. It's mm. got a great soundtrack. Does oh, they've all got great soundtracks. Oh, the yeah. Kel- I, th- I don't think Star Trek has ever had weak music. Like all the scores are just fantastic. Even mm. though it's th- incredibly inconsistent between movies a lot of the times, it, it's always like yeah. really interesting and to listen. I think I think like the ambient ambient music in like mid to late TNG and DS9 and stuff isn't too great. Like because they got rid of the um, 
they got rid of the composer who did Best of Both Worlds and everything before it in TNG. Oh yeah, um, what was his name? Uh, was it Cliff something or was it uh, David something? Yeah. I can't remember, but the, the the music gets markedly worse in uh, in DS Nine and Voyager. Well, I mean the the title themes and stuff are always great, but like the mm. uh, the sort of general scene music. Yeah, the the, the incidental music gets a bit samey. Yeah, where mm. uh, there'll be like shocking revelation, and then as it fades out, the music will go, nah, 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 and that's about it. <laughs> yeah. Ad break. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but there's like the, there's like weird exceptions, like the Voyager two part of Scorpion has its own soundtrack, and it's great. Like, like they, oh, yeah. uh, they they felt that was important enough to write another soundtrack for it, and it's got this really uh, iconic sound to it. And all mm. the films have great music in Star Trek. Yeah, absolutely. Mike, I think Michael Giacchino's stuff is might be my favorite Star Trek music out of the movies. It but is great, it's, yeah. It's very difficult to choose because like Jerry Goldsmith stuff was great, James Horner stuff was great. Yeah, it's all. I mean, I'm I'm a huge fan of uh, Star Trek Enterprise theme, despite everyone in the world disagreeing <laughs> with me. I thought I think it's perfect. It's found its way into far too many of our streams. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like, it's like uh, I like the visuals. Well, I mean, of, I, think they, I think they play, they play together perfectly. Like, uh, yeah. like it's I think I think it's appropriate that Enterprise has a totally different intro. Like if it, if it was just another orchestral piece with the ship flying past the camera a few times, like I'm I'm I much prefer having this uh, visualization of the technology and the progress and all mm. that. I mean, mm. Enterprise didn't always live up to its theme in that respect, but uh, at least the intro did. Like, um, yeah, because did you know it was originally going to be a beautiful day by U two? Was it? Was it really? Yeah. The only, oh. the only reason they, they use that other song is because they would have had to pay for the rights for A Beautiful Day every single time. Oh. They, like, they would have I paid remember, royalties for it. Every I remember single the, episode. The, fa- the famous Eve Online fan film, Clear Skies, used U2 and got, like, oh, yeah. co- co- they, they got like copyright claimed into oblivion. Like, it's, uh, it's almost impossible to find them anymore just because they used U2. So. <laughs> yeah, because they used Elevation, didn't they, for their Yeah. Thing? And it was great. Yeah. It was well timed and all that. The way yeah. the, the way they ended the. I, I like it when a, an an intro song has an opening moment that punctuates the end of the prologue, like um, like the beginning of the Firefly theme, and uh, the oh, first yeah. se- the first season of Killjoys had a really punchy intro theme, and then they replaced it with this rubbish one for the uh, the rest of the show, which was a shame. Because mm. I, I, what do you think of uh, the theme tune in Discovery? I'm. I like the, the the sound of it, but I, I miss like it's not hummable. Is my criticism? It's, it, mm. it, it it like takes a piece of like an original sci-fi, uh, sorry, Star Trek score. Well, it has the big fanfare kind of, at the end. At the end, yeah. but then the rest of it is completely unmemorable. It's yeah, like, I mean, it's not bad. Like the uh, this 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 sort of like building uh, theme. It it sounds like it. It sounds like it's missing its chorus. You know, yeah, it yeah. sounds like it's building, but it's it doesn't mm. quite arrive. It doesn't quite reach an apex. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been worse themes, but uh, I think they would be wise to replace the intro for season two. Mm. Mm. What about visually? What did you think about it? That's, I mean, I like the idea uh, of the visuals, but they choose weird objects to center it on. Yeah, that's true. Like they I, have. I, I like um, the idea of the whole like AutoCAD style. Yeah, that, that's cool. But they use mm. like the spacesuit helmet that they used in like one episode and some big flower thing. Yeah. yeah. What is that big flower thing? It looks like uh, the thing is, that... is it meant to be the alien, the blue alien thing that what's his face goes down to the planet to see? Oh, the um, the thing that Saru messes yeah. up. Yeah, the, the yeah, part of it, know, I... wherever they are. Yeah, it, they're it, the... <laughs> it reminded me of. Uh, do you remember in Galaxy Quest when uh, the pilot is tr- tr- retraining himself so he can fly better? The thing that's on the monitor is like an old Galaxy Quest episode, and he's he's flying the ship around like this big. <laughs> Tentacled monster. Oh yeah, with like one yeah. <laughs> it reminded me of that. <laughs> I mean, I'm. I've always said I'm. I'm uh, all for more giant cosmozoan space krakens and stuff on sci-fi. <laughs> we don't get enough stuff like that. Honestly, you can't get them to stop saying it. It's just all the time. We need more space krakens. <laughs> we do. We're good. Yeah. It is. Is yeah. It's a good idea. I don't know about the the whale things in uh, Rebels. Did you guys like? Did you watch Rebels? Uh, Rebels. I, I mean, overall, I loved Rebels. I think, um, but it is guilty of the classic Filoni filler problem, where uh, mm. it's like o- o- only important things only happen in season finales and, and endings, like uh, and the rest of the time, like it doesn't. I mean, 
I don't know. It, it doesn't really do characterization too well, and there's, there's it's, it has its moments. Yeah, it has its moments, like with um, Agent Callus and yeah, uh, I mean, Zeb being stuck on the planet. I mean, Rebels. Like, I, I think the end of season two with uh, Twilight of the Apprentice, and the end of season three with the Battle of Atalon, are the, the twin peaks of the show. They're the apexes, and they're amazing. They're like like uh, the, the Battle of Atalon is, is is maybe the best battle in the new canon of Star Wars mm. like it's so good yeah. and it's it's so well structured and it's like the tension is dialed all the way up but then uh, season 4 I didn't think was as good as uh, as the seasons before it and it's it's I don't know it, it, it's not consistent in quality but when it gets it right it really gets it right because mm. I've seen uh, the Clone Wars but, but I haven't gotten around to watching Rebels all the way through I think it's That's definitely it. worth worth going through Rebels uh, the, the the one um, the one big advantage it has is that it's like uh, whereas where Clone Wars is like an ensemble anthology thing with loads of different like generals and stuff, Rebels has a maintained consistent cast which I I really appreciate. It's uh, it, it's nice having that. It mean it means that even when an episode is a bit of a dud, you still get the dynamic and you still like sort of check in with these characters, which it makes it a bit more like because when, when when Clone Wars did a bad episode, like the um, I think I had that bloody D Squad arc with the, the droids with the oh, yeah. Colonel Gascon. It's like five parts. It's like it's like five times <laughs> five times longer than it has any right to be. Yeah. And, you've uh, been and stuck with that story. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. If it's it, if you've got a consistent cast, then you can get away with a bit of a dud story just because you're entertained by the characters and you. you like... I liked every episode that Hondo turned up. Yeah, Hondo's great. <laughs> <laughs> that would do it for me. Yeah, how's uh, Resistance shaping up? Because I haven't seen that yet. Well, well, we're really enjoying Resistance. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's very it's very comfortable. It's like uh, it's very chilled out, and it's like it's following the same uh, formula that Rebels used. Like, um, it's it's pretty obvious that it's going to hit the fan at the end of season one. Like the way the way it's set up, it's like we're in we're in the chill status quo time now, and mm. something's going to go horribly wrong at the end, and then season two is going to be more serious because like it, it's just Dave Filoni's just sticking to his format which is, uh, I'm is having, fair enough I'm having more fun just developing my own head cannon for everything have you watched uh, Star Wars Resistance by the way no I haven't seen it yet no oh so so basically at the start uh, like Poe Dameron picks up this 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 young fighter pilot in the new fancy X-Wing and then sends him on this uh, the premise is he sends him on this like spying mission to go to the station and you kind of think why Why would he send this guy that he's just met to do this? And they were like, did he just nick the T-85 X-Wing <laughs> or the Resistance? <laughs> so it's there's... Like, uh, there's yeah. Made up this... Uh, a a, a headcanon has developed that he's just <laughs> he's just invented a job for this guy to do <laughs> so that he can rob his X-Wing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We've, we're been, not, we've been considering doing a sketch video where we put subtitles on BB-8. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because uh, because BB BB8 gets left with this kid, like, uh, Poe po just leaves BB8 there to watch over him, and uh, mm. obviously he's like he's like the Ezra, Ahsoka early seasons kind of allegory. Like he's he's a bit like kiddie and clueless and and like visual comedy kind of thing. So mm. uh, it'd be quite funny to have everything BB8 says just translated as like, "What is this idiot doing? Why have I been left here? Somebody <laughs> save me!" <laughs> yeah, that could be really good. Yeah. Speaking of something uh, completely different, what do you think of... Uh, there's apparently a reboot, a feature film reboot of Battlestar Galactica is in the works. Uh, with, um, what's his name? Francis Lawrence directing it, and Lisa Joy from Westworld is apparently in the writing team. Mm. Do you know about this? Uh, I, I knew that they were doing a reboot. I didn't know any real details about it. Yeah. Um, I, I assume it's not going to be the RDM canon, which is a real shame though to be fair the um the the central beats and premise of Battlestar Galactica like i mean i'm not a huge fan of the original series but the the central concept is great because it it's and it's something that we've tried to emulate in the sojourn it's based entirely on scarcity which is important like it's got mm. you've got limited ships and limited people and limited resources and everything matters and you have the, the viewers have a clear accounting of how important it is when something is lost and how good it is when something is gained and it's like you're plugged into that and they never there's no like go to a starbase and fix everything or get a new thing brought in between episodes or whatever and that that sort of scarcity is persistent between like you can't make a version of Battlestar Galactica where where that isn't the case so uh, I think any, anything is that they do will have that at least which is nice yeah I'm just fascinated how they because I feel like that premise is great for a TV show, but I'm 
interested to see how they squeeze it into a movie because it's got to end on a cliffhanger, right? Yeah, I, I I don't think that I I, it's, I don't think it's going to be able to. A, a film is not the best medium for delivering that story, uh, really. Yeah, I don't think so because it's it's because it's just going to be franchise bait no matter what, and it's like, well, Battlestar Galactica has a fan base, but is it big enough to support a movie franchise? Mm. I don't think so personally, but we'll see about that. Are there any like up and coming sci fi things that you guys are excited about, like the next Star Wars or? What Star Trek is doing because Star Trek seems to be doing. There's stuff being greenlit left, right, and center. Like, uh, but they're, they're apparently planning to have um, Star Trek being new Star Trek being released every month of the year. That's that's their plan. Oh, oh what? Like, wow. uh, or JJ Bus movies or just n- anything? anything. They like uh, they're 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 greenlighting sufficient Star Trek content that at least one thing will be out every month. Mm. So uh, that's got to be a lot, mm. and Which, there is a danger of saturation in that respect. I think there is. Yeah, I, but well, I'm. Uh, I don't know. I feel like that you you might get more um, stuff which people won't enjoy. But I, I think the more different IPs you're putting out there, it just means it's more likely to know. get I'm, something I'm, which be good. It's a completely futile position for me to have, but uh, I'm generally opposed to perpetuating the massive franchises in in contrast to making new sci-fi. Well, largely, I agree. Yeah, like uh, we need more original content and. Uh, I, like as much as I enjoy a lot of Star Trek and Star Wars and stuff like that, if I had the capacity to to stop to stop the continuation of those franchises in favor of new ideas, I think that would be healthy for the genre mm. overall. Because like you know, you've got all this stuff with like toxic fan bases and things these days, and oh boy, yeah. a, and a lot of uh, a lot of IPs become more about canon housekeeping than any kind of meaning. Like the original the original themes and message are lost in a in a sort of like massive world building that it's just it's it's more about like becoming an expert and piecing together all of these uh bits of continuity and i think like like battlestar galactica the rdm series famously sci-fi channel wanted to renew it more because it was the most successful thing they'd ever done and ronald d moore said no this is it four seasons and we're done this is the story i want to tell and i, I have a lot of respect for a mm. a, 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 a sort a story that, that does its job and then goes away like uh and and, and lets that be its legacy Mm. I understand that. <coughs> Pardon me. Something which I'm kind of interested in Star Trek, because what I quite like about Star Trek and uh, Battlestar Galactica as well, actually, but um, is just how broad they both are, especially because the two adaptations we've got of Battlestar Galactica, or the two versions, sorry, are so incredibly different. Yeah. Like the, the original series is this lighthearted, you know, romp through space and. The reboot is this very gritty, shaky cam, you know, military yeah, science fiction. It's probably show. the most bleak sci-fi franchise. Ard- Ardian yeah. Battlestar is like, it's it's pretty draining. Expanse yeah. is up there. Oh, I guess it's like uh, the, the the Expanse is pretty. Um, I don't know. I guess the, the the worlds and technologies and current situation prior to everything going wrong in Battlestar Galactica mm-hmm. is pretty different. I mean, I don't know. Like you you watch late season three and season four of Battlestar Galactica, and, it, it's and it's pretty grim, it's yeah. just grim. Like like yeah. everything everything is horrible, and like everyone's a complete train wreck, and you just feel feel bad for everything that's happening. It's quite hard to power through. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, because well, that's why I'm kind of interested in this new movie. Is like. What direction are they going to take it in? Are they going to do a bit of both, or are they going to go in some other direction? That's 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 the thing I'm quite curious about. Is the kind of the new take on it? And with these new um, Star Trek shows, Star Trek is like so broad as a franchise that every episode you can have like like a courtroom drama, or you can have like a weird timey wimey thing, or you can have like a bottle episode or a space opera type thing. That what I'm quite excited about with these new shows is just how wide they're kind of casting the net where you have Discovery mm. which the first season is kind of R-rated and a bit violent and things like that but then this yeah. Patrick this new Picard show is back to the uh, 24th or 25th century maybe and then there's an animated show as well and I just think I appreciate that they're actually pl- shaking things up a bit they're not really yeah. being complacent they're just kind of saying let's just do something interesting with the franchise each time and I think if they keep shaking up like that I'm okay with with lots and lots of more Star Trek content, but that's what I think. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm surprised it's taken this long to set something post Voyager. Yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was thinking. Like, um, I I hate the whole like I having done three years of space dock. I've been driven to despise the obsession with canon over 
content. Oh, yeah. Like, uh, uh, so the, the, a lot of the attitude that Star Trek fans had toward Discovery just really annoys me. Uh, mm. uh, but but even even though that doesn't bother me, if I'd been like involved in the production, I'd have been like savvy enough to say, you know, this this is not where we should set this because it's just going to piss people off for no good reason. Like uh, this, the same story could have been told some other time period, and they just open themselves up to to, uh, to problems. But uh, and, and and honestly, the um, the like the, the the current generation of Star Trek fans are left over from when everything was happening in the nineties, and the twenty fourth century is their Star Trek. Like that, that's where yeah. you go to appeal to these people, and also ha- half the actors are still around to guest star like if he wanted to get Brent Spiner in or whatever mm. like uh, they probably should have started by setting something post Voyager but uh, they were wise to do that now I think yeah mm. I was because I was slightly disappointed when I heard it was another prequel and uh, I I had manufactured all these conspiracy theories in my head about what they were going to do with Discovery because when they talked about like this new way to fly and uh, with the spore drive and that they were going to cross dimensions and all that kind of stuff because Jonathan Frakes gave that away at a con apparently mm. Where uh, he spoiled that they had the Mirror Universe episode before anyone yeah, knew, yeah. and uh, so I was thinking, ah, maybe it goes to the Mirror Universe, but it can't find its way home, and then it time that's, jumps. That's and does exactly stuff, what we thought. We, we, well. we, we yeah. thought that we thought that was going to happen, like to the moment the episode was like, because there's that bit when they uh, they come back from the Mirror Universe, and he's like, we're yeah. back, but it's not the same. Like we we we're back later than we planned. Yeah, and, and we I was were like, watching. We were like, "Oh shit!" And, 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 and it's nine months later. Like, oh right. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, "Ah," <laughs> oh. because it it seemed like a very that that seemed like the obvious choice for uh, contriving why no one's still using the spore drive. Yeah, in, because in the they future. just yeah. vanished or whatever. Because they just disappeared. Yeah. yeah, I I connected the same dots in my head, and when it said nine months, I was like, "Oh, oh, okay, <laughs> we're still we're still in the twenty third century. Oh well." But yeah, like that. That's oh, the kind well. of thing where. Um, you you wonder how nobody put their hand up in in the writing room and said, "Hey, listen, this this isn't gonna the Star Trek fans aren't gonna like this." Like there's a like there's a moment where the computer calls out a D seven. Like it's like there's a D seven over there, and yeah. then it, cu- it, and it looks to something like that's a D7. not a D seven. It's like why? <laughs> why why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> like I mean, you've already you've already like incited the wrath of enough crazy people for one day. Don't 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 just, just like poke them for no reason. <laughs> Yeah, mm. I have a a brother who's who's terrible for that kind of stuff. Where it's like the slightest technological change in things, he's like, he's like, ah, well, it was fine, but it's not really Star Trek. Like he even had a problem back in Deep Space Nine when they built the Defiant. He was like, ah, they they can't have the Defiant because Starfleet doesn't build warships. This isn't really Star Trek, is it? Mm. And I'm like, ah, oh, come on, man. <laughs> you know, that's just getting unreasonable. I, I quite like how... Uh, I feel like that's kind of the point of Deep Space Nine, though, isn't well, deep, it? The, deep, the whole thing yeah. is just the Federation being outside of its comfort zone. But you know what? Deep Space Nine, uh, it does something that uh, is very... It, it's like it's very rare that an opportunity to do this presents itself, and it's where it basically attacks the central themes of its parent franchise. Like, yeah. uh, mm. like Deep Space Nine has that, and uh, to a lesser extent, the Wrath of Khan has it, because the, the, the Wrath of Khan is, is, is basically a mockery of Kirk's command style in the original series like it's uh it's somebody who who wasn't involved in tos who looks at how kirk acts in tos and says right we're gonna have a story where kirk learns his lesson and realizes that it isn't this isn't all fun and games yeah. and he actually has to to get it get it together and then in the same vein uh deep space nine turns around and pokes fun at the sort of vulnerable defenseless pacifist federation and points out how they could just be attacked by people who cannot be negotiated away and, and like, it takes a realist uh, look at that idea. Mm. Mm. That's why I really and appreciate also, about Deep Space good. Nine, yeah. Yeah, Deep Space Nine is fantastic in that regard. It's uh, it's the best Star Trek series as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, it me too, seems yeah. to put, point out their utopian, moneyless future where Cisco's dad is breaking his back making jambalaya in a restaurant he doesn't actually <laughs> have to run. Cisco, Cisco's dad's restaurant, it like it's like the biggest conundrum in the entire IP. <laughs> like, it, it violates I'll, all the rules. <laughs> Just make any sense. I, I love there's a conversation between uh, I think it's Nog and uh, Jake Cisco, where they say like why why do you work or something like that or like how do you get paid and he's like we don't we don't have money and he's like well how do you how do you make a living and he's like we work to better ourselves and then Nog says but what does that mean and then Jake Cisco's like what. Uh, 
and he just sort of trails <laughs> off. <laughs> that's the uh, that, that's the episode where he's tr- he's trying to get Nog savings in order to buy something, <laughs> yeah. and, and he's like, "Haven't haven't you got any of your own money?" He's like, "I don't have any money. I'm human." And it's like, "Why do humans have money? We don't need money. We work to better ourselves." He's like, "Well, if you don't need money, you certainly don't need mine." <laughs> 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 It's like uh, under under the slightest scrutiny, it all flies apart. <laughs> so it's a very nice future to imagine, but mm. at the same time, there are practicalities to consider. I mean, they did are... the same thing with Eddington. Some of the best episodes of DS Nine. Oh yeah, absolutely. With Ed- yeah. Eddington, where it's 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 him, and he describes the Federation as being just like the Borg. Mm. And they they did that to a lesser extent in Discovery, where they they suggest that. Takuvma is worried that the Klingon cultural identity will be like homogenized into the Federation, and that's uh, mm. that's what his concern is that that no no original like cultural identity survives and it all just becomes like uh, Federation, mm. and that's that that's a great uh, motivation for an antagonist to have. Yeah, it's a, it's it's a really good kind of deconstruction of what you come to expect from Star Trek, and I guess. You know, some fans sort of interpret that as being inherently disrespectful to the franchise, but I think it's probably the most respectful thing you can actually do is to to look at uh, it closer. It's, and really it's more of a it. storytelling opportunity than anything else. I mm. mean, one of my uh, one of my very favorite uh, works of, of written fiction or, or, or any kind of science fiction at all is uh, Knights of the Old Republic Two, the, uh, oh, yeah. the Bioware game, and that is just. A complete disassembly of all of the assumptions that you would have after watching the Star Wars films. Like it's, uh, it's that the the central theme of Kotor Two is binary morality is silly, and here's why. And like yeah. it, it just takes apart this whole light side dark side thing, and puts it like it, it shows a more a more realistic depiction of uh, of like human morality and and makes it work in communication with the uh, with how the Force is set up. And they even have. Um, Kreia, the villain from from Kotor Two, who is incredibly performed in in voice acting, like one of my my all time favorite voice performances, and her whole philosophy is that the Force, by trying to force people to be light or dark, is like it's like contravening free will and it's like controlling people, and and, and she wants to stop, like she's trying to block out the Force because it's like it's like threatening people's personal independence, and that's like. Such a fantastic, fantastic uh, yeah, angle. Yeah. Mm. So, what uh, what's in store? Do you think for the future of the Space Dot Channel? Oof. Any big plans, or is the Sojourn what you're uh, set on right now? Think, thinking about things that uh, that are beyond the Sojourn Kickstarter makes me scared, so I don't want to. <laughs> 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 it's like, <laughs> okay, okay, like we're, 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 we're working on this every single day, and it's like we're just going just to get to the Kickstarter for God's sake. <laughs> Let's get a Kickstarter <laughs> so we can, at the very least, make back the cost of the pilot. <laughs> it's it's very like because I've never had to deal with like a budget and all this before and paying people mm. in different places and it, it's very panicky. We might get some mugs together at some. Oh, point. Oh yeah, we're gonna do a merch store at some. Stay but tuned. You, you, you've you've had many pan- panicky phone calls from me. Like I'll w- <laughs> I'll wake up and I'll have the latest information on the. Sometimes so sometimes you're fine and sometimes I'm like. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> there's, so, there's so much money flying around, Alistair. Help me. <laughs> we're gonna make this. Thing. <laughs> We've got to release this tomorrow oh. so that I can afford to eat. <laughs> but yeah, uh, oh, yeah. I think uh, right. I, I have like I, I want to do more narrative stuff. Not uh, I want to like I want to talk about more things that aren't spaceships on on uh, Space Dog, and also like I kind of I kind of feel like if I have this platform, I I, uh, I would be remiss not to try and expand the genre by marketing narrative stuff with it. So uh, there's, there's, I, I have other ideas beyond the sojourn for years and years in the future that I would like to try and have a go at, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I, there's, there's, generally speaking, the, the sojourn is in the crosshairs right now. I think. Mm. Well, I'm very much looking forward to it. I appreciate that. Oh, I'm glad you. someone is. We need. To... <laughs> <laughs> oh come on! You got like what 150,000 subs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah you... fifty thousand more than we had when we started the sojourn. <laughs> so that's uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, if we keep 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 making it's it for a couple more years, years and then it can't <laughs> fail. <laughs> <laughs> Never release everything. Just keep making it. <laughs> uh, well, I wish you all the best of luck. I think how long we've been going with it for about an hour now. I think this mission's about to wrap up. So. Oh, well. Good I've got to say, I've been, I've been very impressed with you playing and holding up these conversations. I can't do more than one thing at once like that. Yeah, I've been impressed with myself as well. I tried this earlier and I completely 
lost my train of thought constantly. So I've not, I've not been paying much attention. <laughs> These Klingon ships, they're very blue. They are very blue. And there's Starfleet. Oh, there's a... Uh, what's that? A thingy class? Not not um, Europa. That's the particular name, name of the ship. I, I don't know. I do occasionally get very distracted by your quite wonderful hairstyle and moustache whenever a... Uh, like, <laughs> whenever, uh, I, I was trying not to like, laugh when... When you guys were speaking, just looking at my own character. <laughs> yeah, I was as well. <laughs> uh, uh, well giant uh, mop, mop top haircut. Exactly, yeah. Is it a mop top? I think it's like sort of a mop which has been used far too many times. <laughs> Certainly a something top. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I think we'll we'll wrap it up there mid-battle then. Sure. Okay, great stuff. Yeah, yeah so uh, thank I you think- so much for... For coming along, guys. No, thank you so much for having us. We've got to we've got to get yeah. back to actually making the show gen now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. we. Well, I'll definitely watch it when it comes out and share awesome. it. And so on. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Yeah, no problem. So, catch you later, guys. Yeah, oh, no see you guys. Later. Thanks for having us. Bye bye. Thank you so much for watching, and a big thank you to Daniel and Alistair from Space Dog for joining me. If you'd like to know more about the Soldier, and then jump over to their channel and check out their usual videos, which are always awesome. If you like my videos, then be sure to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of all new uploads. Over on my Patreon, you can see videos up to a week early for as little as $5 a month, but really, any support helps immensely. Speaking of which, I'd like to thank my patrons Chris Lord, Millie Coleman, Snijana Markova, L. Carton, T. Stoney, Andy Luke, James, and Larry Bennett. I'll have more videos coming soon, but until next time, have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.